Well, good morning again, church. Before we open up the Word of God, let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you, to sing praises to your name. And we are also grateful for the us for this opportunity we have to open up your word. Father, help it to be a blessing to us and help us to seek to apply your word to our lives. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Now, the song we just sang is We Believe. And and I love because it's kind of a statement of faith of we believe in God. We believe in the Father. We believe in Christ. We believe that he sent his only son. All of this wonderful stuff. It's just a wonderful statement of who we are and what we believe. And as Christians, it's important for us to proclaim that to others and to let others know. And sometimes it seems like what we believe becomes more of opinion rather than grounded in Scripture. And it seems that what we believe becomes something that we feel can be debated. And while there are things that are of opinion that we can believe, there are many things that are factual. There's many things that we are called to maintain and to hold to as Christians. And so Romans chapter 6, Paul talks about some of these things. And I believe this is relevant in not just the time of Paul, but even in our time today. Because in our time, we need more than ever, I believe, in our lifetime to believe in God and who he says he is, to believe that God is at work, to believe, as we talked about last week from Habakkuk, that God is working even when we don't know what he's doing in our life. And so this is what Paul writes in chapter 6, verse 1 of Romans. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And so Paul is saying, look, just because you have grace, just because you follow God, does that mean that we're called to sin? Does that mean we're able and allowed to do anything and everything that we want? And he says, no, by no means. That's not at all what I'm saying. And he says this again in verse 15. Are we to sin because we're under grace, not the law? And he says, again, no way, not a chance. And look what he says in verse 2. How can we who died to sin still live in it? You see, what we believe informs what we practice. What we believe teaches others what God wants, but it also helps us to live a life of holiness. Our beliefs, those things we hold dear, they inform our practice. We do what we do because of our beliefs, or at least we should. And if we don't, then we have a bigger problem. And we often get caught up in everything else going around. We get caught up in what's politically correct. We get caught up in all these different ideas that we forget to hold on to our belief and to allow that belief to inform not just our decision making, but our practice. And so how can we who died to sin still live in it? You said, you see, Paul says that we have died to sin. We've been baptized with Christ. And because we have died to sin, he says, you do not live in sin any longer. You have been set free. So move beyond sinfulness. He says this in verse 3, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death? Now, this is one of the things that we believe here, and that is that when we are baptized, when we go under that water, that we've been baptized into the death of Christ, just as Christ was buried and raised. We too are buried and raised. And it says in verse 4, We were buried therefore with him by baptism or through baptism. We are buried with him, not through a belief, not through accepting him into our heart, not through doing any of these other things that says it is through baptism into death. It's through baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You see, we've been baptized with God so that as we come out of that water, not only are we forgiven of our sins, not only are we dead to those sins, but we have newness of life. We have been raised to newness of life just as Christ had. And Paul elaborates on this in verse 15 and verse 5, I'm sorry. And and this is not uncommon in scripture. It's the if-then clause here. 
He says in verse 5, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, and then we have the understood then clause that follows, if we have been understood with him in a death like his, then we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Did you catch that? You're only united in a resurrection like his if you have been buried like him, if you've been united in his death. And Paul just explained that this is all throughout scripture of how we're united in that death. And that is through baptism. But this morning, it's not just a baptism sermon that we want to talk about. We want to talk about the belief system that we have. Because this is all tied in to the belief. And so he says in verse 6, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Isn't that great? One who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Did you catch that? If we have died, if we have truly died, then we will believe that we will also be resurrected. We will also overcome death. We will also live with him. Verse 9, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. Church, we are given new life. We are given this life of abundance, this life of uh, that Christ has, this new walk, this new purpose, because we have died with Christ in a death as he has died. And so we've been told that we too will raise from the dead. In verse 8, once again, it said, we believe that we will also live with him. Church, do we believe this? Do we believe that there is something beyond the grave? Do we believe that there is something beyond our past? Do we believe that when we go into that water, we've been forgiven, that when we come out, we walk a new life? Or have we just given up on the new life and we just walk in whatever way we used to? We just walk in whatever way we want to. You see, I believe that we sometimes forget what God has done. And maybe we don't forget, but maybe we struggle with that belief that he actually could forgive us. Maybe we struggle with the belief that we actually could have a different life. You know, the biggest problem that people often have in getting out of whatever their old ways are is they don't have a belief that it can happen. So many people, and there's always exceptions to the rule, but so many people are stuck at the bottom of the rung in their career because they don't believe they ever could climb that ladder, if you will. So many people are stuck in debt because they don't believe that it is possible for them to give out, get out of debt. What they've done is just they've given up. They've taken that mentality of, oh, well, what's the use? It'll never work out for me. I don't have all that money like so-and-so does. I don't get those great chances and those great opportunities like such-and-such gives to their employees. And the truth is, if you go talk to the people who've crawled out of debt, if you've talked to the people who've crawled out of a horrible back life, if you've talked to those people who have overcome hardship, they didn't get it handed to them. They worked, and they believed that it would pay off. You see, in Christ, we have to believe that we have this new life because our beliefs inform our practice. If we don't truly believe we have new life, if we don't truly believe God can do something great through us, then we never will see God do something great in us. You see, Moses, whenever Moses was told to go to Pharaoh, one of the problems Moses had was he didn't believe that with God it was going to be possible. It took him a while, actually. How many times do we struggle with believing God is doing what he claims he will do? That he is who he claims he is. 
and he works the way he says he works. And so Paul talks about this. And, and, and Paul talks to the Roman church about this belief that if we have died with Christ, we are in Christ. And if we are in Christ, God is working in and through us. And we will raise from the dead. We have hope. Doesn't matter how bleak the future on the earth looks. We have hope. We know the ending of Revelation. God wins. And as his children, we win as well. And because we have this hope, because we maintain this belief, it informs our practice. And that's what Paul looks at in chapter 6, verse 12. Therefore, let no sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. You see, Paul says, if you truly believe who God is and what God is, if you truly believe that you are in need of his salvation, if you truly believe that you are in need of his purpose in your life, if you truly believe all of these things that come with the Christian walk, he says, then you won't let sin reign in your mortal body. You might mess up, but you're not going to go out willingly sinning and you're going to try your hardest to address whatever sin you still find in your life. He says, let sin therefore not reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Well, why is that? What does he have to do with making you obey its passions? You see, we're either controlled, but we're controlled by one of two things. We're either controlled by the world or Satan or evil, however you want to address that sinful nature Paul talks about, or we're controlled by Christ and the mind of Christ. And Paul says, if you are of Christ, if you believe that God is who he says he is, when you become a Christian, when you're baptized, when you're raised to walk a new life, that informs you and your practice. And because it informs your practice, you don't obey your passions or that sinful nature you had. You obey Christ and his teachings. Why? It's not because it's fun all the time. It's not because it's easy all the time. And sometimes it's not even because it's good for us, because we don't always want things that are good for us. We do it because we know and we believe that at the end it pays off. And we believe God is who he claims to be. You see, we don't allow ourselves to live according to the sinfulness of the flesh. Look in verse 13, he reiterates this. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but rather, in other words, present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Church, if you believe you've been brought to life, if you believe you've been raised to newness of life, live that way. Live like you have a new life. When we're all stuck at home because of the coronavirus, don't run around saying, woe is me. But tell people God is still there. God is still in control. When you have a hard day like I do sometimes and all of us do sometimes, don't mope around but say God is there. God is in control. God is watching. God is taking care of everything. Present yourselves to God as one who has been brought from life, I'm sorry, from death into life. And this means we do the things of God. You see, we live in a resurrected state in the here and now, not just in the future. We live in a resurrected state the moment we come out of that water. We live in a way that is in you know we we live in a way that is in agreement with our belief and that helps us identify ourselves to God so it says present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as I love this phrase I have it underlined in my Bible as instruments of righteousness. Do you present yourself as an instrument to righteousness to God? For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law 
but you are under grace. Church, we have been set free from death. In fact, later on in the same chapter, in verse 23, Paul writes, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Church, we have received the gift of God, that freedom, that newness of life, the here and now resurrected life. The question is, are we living that life? Are we following Christ? Are we practicing what we believe, and what we claim. You see, this is more than just sin. This encompasses everything in life. If we believe in God, then when times get tough, we're going to trust in God. If we believe in God, then whenever we're tempted to sin, we're going to trust in God and follow God. If we believe in God, when we are threatened because of our faith, we put our trust in God and we stand Firm, if we believe in God, we don't let anything come between us and our Lord. If we believe in God, our lives change drastically. Church, we are in an interesting time. A lot of stuff is changing and will stay changed. But church, we believe in an unchanging God. We believe in a God that regardless of what happens on this world, he is in control, he saves, and he has sent us to save. We believe in a God that is all-powerful, almighty, and all-loving. So let me ask you this this morning, church. Do your practices match your belief? Not just your Sunday morning practice, but do your practices each and every day, each and every moment of your life, do they match your beliefs? Because as Christians, we are called to allow those beliefs to infiltrate and change every aspect about us. Church, we've been given new life. And Christ said in John 10, 10, he has given it to us so that we might live it to the fullest. I want to encourage you this week to allow your practices to be informed and changed by your beliefs so that you might go and live your life to the fullest and bring others into Christ so that they too might find fullness of life. And then they too might go out and bring others in as well. Father, thank you so much for the goodness of life. Thank you so much for your joy. Thank you so much for your love. We're just so blessed to be part of your kingdom and part of your work and ministry. Help us to transform our practices by implementing our beliefs and your teachings. Help us to encourage each other in hard times, to love each other in times of loss and sickness. And help us to reach out to all those who need to know you in any way and in any moment that we can. Thank you for your son. Thank you for his sacrifice. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.